We are coming to the very end of Ruth chapter 1 now, spending a number of weeks going through this chapter and building the scene and making application as we move along. And we will take time, I think, to read from verse 14, read to the end of the chapter, Ruth chapter 1, verse 14. They lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth cleave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left, speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home empty, again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Amen. Trusting the Lord will give light in his word, beloved, and how we need it. We need light, and the Spirit alone will give that light. Let's pray just momentarily, please. <clears throat> Our God, we come to thy word. We come knowing that our hearts still need more change. We are not as much like Christ as we need to be. And so we pray for the transforming power of thy word to be manifest as each one of us sits under its authority today. Thou knowest every heart, and thou knowest the need of every soul. And I pray Regardless of my inability to know the inner needs of any person, I pray the blessed Spirit who knows all things may take the word, yes, Lord, may even direct my heart, my thoughts, to make application and to make teaching that is relevant to every single person, regardless of age or circumstance. Be bless us then, fill us with the Holy Ghost, and do a mighty work amongst us, O oh God, build thy church and strengthen thy people. We pray all this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. As we come to the end of Ruth chapter 1, I want us to take just a few minutes to consider some of the things that we have learned. First of all, to remind ourselves that we have learned that God's sheep sadly do wander. This is a reality that is borne out through the Scriptures and is seen evidently in Ruth chapter 1. The people of God at times go to places and do things that they ought not to do and places they ought not to go. That's just sad, but it's a reality and we cannot turn a blind eye to it. We can't just say, well, you know, if someone turns away, then they were never saved, or if they turn away, then, well, you know, uh, try and interpret in some other way other than what Scriptures have revealed as plain. God's people at times turn away from Him. We are told by the psalmist, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. But the next verse goes on to say, Though he fall, though he fall, yet shall he not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And David is acknowledging the fact that the steps of a good man, that is a saved man, a, a, a life that has been changed and transformed by the gospel, that person will go on God's way and the Lord will delight in it and the man will delight in it and everything will be fine. But there are, are occasions when that man will fall. 
to varying degrees, of course, but he may fall. And David, of course, is a very testimony to that fact. Though he fall, and the encouragement is not in the man. The encouragement is not in the strength of the individual. The encouragement is in the strength of the Lord because that is what prevents him from being utterly cast down. Why does David say the man is not utterly cast down? Because the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And this is on display here in Ruth. Regardless of the wanderings of Naomi, regardless of where she had went and how long she had been there, she is not utterly cast down. The Lord is upholding her with his hand. So while God's sheep sadly do wander, the next thing we've learned is that God puts a limit on their wandering. On occasions, their wandering may end in death. That's not something we like to think about, but again, plainly evident from the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 11 being prob probably the most prominent mark of that, the fact that Paul is acknowledging many sleep because of their rebellion. But in most cases, thankfully, in most cases, how the Lord honors himself in the wandering sheep isn't bringing them back, is causing them to return to where they ought to have been in the first place. He puts a limit and he brings them graciously back to himself. And so their life, due to the long suffering and mercy and patience of God, ends in restoration. And I hope that's the case for any wandering here this morning. Your heart is away from God. You're in the far country, you're in Moab. But I trust, I trust if it hasn't been already the case as a result of the messages that have come from this book, I trust even today the work of restoration God may begin in your heart and bring you to himself and where you ought to be. We learned also that regardless of the outcome of our wanderings, the wages of sin are harder to bear than they are pleasurable. Whatever was in the mind of Elimelech and Naomi that took them into Moab, whatever was their original intent, and we tried to paint some possibilities there, and there may be even some other possibilities that we do not, do not know, but whatever took them there in the first place, it didn't result in the enjoyment of their life and the fulfillment of their life. There's no doubt that they didn't go down there to suffer. <laughs> I think we can assume that much. They didn't go to Moab to have a hard time. They went there to have a better time. They trusted, they hoped, but that was not the case at all. Their rebellion left them in an afflicted state. Indeed, Elimelech is taken into eternity, and Naomi is a broken woman as she returns to Bethlehem, and she acknowledges that in the words we'll be considering today. The wages of sin are harder to bear than they are pleasurable, and I don't want you to forget that. Whatever the temptation is in your heart that is causing you to consider not being as devoted to Christ as you know you ought to be, I want you to know that by harboring that idol, by pursuing that path, you will suffer more than all the promises that pleasure gives to you. I'm quite certain there are people here, in fact, I know, but I'm sure there are more than what I'm even aware of. Individuals sitting here this morning who could give testimony to that fact that they took another direction in life, they went away from the Lord, they spent time in the far country, and whenever it promised them initially, it all ended in sadness and bitterness and sorrow. And they lament the path that they took and trod. The grace of God awakens her conscience to her sin. Naomi becomes aware of the folly of her ways, which is why she makes her way back to Bethlehem. We also noted that when we give up our prodigal ways, this is to our encouragement, when we give up our prodigal ways and give up heading in our own direction and start making our way back to where we ought to be, God is often pleased to use that in the lives of others. As soon as Naomi begins the, the journey back to Bethlehem, is it not that that becomes the instrument by which Ruth brings out or manifests her trust in the true and living God? 
she heads there, it becomes a moment of decision for Orpah and Ruth. Are we going to worship the God this woman worships? Are we going to give our hearts to the God she has perhaps manifested in her life to some degree? And the one we're aware of through the marriage that we had to Malon and Kilion, uh, we, we become acquainted with the God of Israel. And now we have a choice. And as she makes her way back, they have a choice to make too. And that leads to the conversion of Ruth. So when we give up going astray, we have, to, we have to make that point. We have to realize that, child of God here this morning, you have to realize that your wanderings don't only affect you. When you're wandering in the far country, you're denying a positive influence to your friends and family. A positive influence that could be the very means under the hand of God to bring them to saving faith. So why are you in the far country? Do you not care about their soul? Does the pleasure of your sin matter more to you than the eternal state of those you love? Is it possible that some of us would be weighing that in the balance and struggling to make the right choice? I have family members, I have friends, I have neighbors that need to hear Christ preached and lived in all of its purity. And yet here I am without a testimony. If I would only sort out my life, I could influence them for good. But as I live at present, I am no influence at all except to sin and to disobedience. As we close this chapter, I want us to consider the prodigal woman returns. The prodigal woman returns. And I understand the true meaning of the word prodigal. It means wasting of the substance and so on. And while that's not highlighted in the very specific way that it is by the prodigal in Luke 15, I think we can see the theme here of this woman being a prodigal in a sense, returning to where she ought to be. So as we look at this, let us see first of all the talk of her return. The talk of her return, verses 19 and 20 tell us, So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. They journey on. They make their way. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem's not a very big place, you know. It's not large. There aren't that many people there. It's not a huge city. It's not Calgary. They're coming in. People perhaps out in the perimeter, in their fields, doing the various things. News begins to travel. that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And this is the talk. This is the conversation. This is what is going on as people uh, try to observe these individuals that are making their way into Bethlehem. One of them, they have no clue who she is. The other one, they're wondering. They're wondering, is this Naomi? I don't know whether she uh, had corresponded with anyone. I don't know if anyone knew of the change in her circumstances of the death of her husband and the death of her sons. We're not told that. But as she makes her way back, they're looking at her, and, and it seems to be, I think some commentators are right, that by her very countenance, these ten years had been hard on her. The way of the transgressor is hard, and it will be manifest on your very countenance. Of course, young people are trying to keep their youth Older ones are trying to get it back. They're all about keeping youth. And it's, it's, it's amazing now, isn't it? Amazing you have those in their 20s who are getting Botox. I kid you not. In their 20s. You couldn't see a wrinkle if you examined them within millimeters. And yet they're getting Botox. And I'm telling you the truth. For real. But I'll tell you. All the Botox in the world will not change. If you change the, your look, your demeanor, your countenance. If you give yourself to a life of sin, it will be written all over your face. You'll get to a certain stage of life and people will wonder, what happened to that person? <laughs> and I'll, you know, this sounds strange perhaps. And I know I'm not a picture of youth at all, but when I, when I see some, of pe some people who I know are my age, on the last... For almost 14 years I've been a Christian and they've continued on living in a career of alcohol and drugs and debauchery and what, what not, whatever you want to say. God knows what they've been involved in. I'll tell you, they do not look anywhere near 
how Melanie and I look, they look way older. Some of them, they look way older. And it's not that we take particular care of ourselves because I'm not exactly running on the streets every day and looking after myself perhaps the way I should. But sin, sin shows in the face. Some may think God was harsh and know me, you know. They may look at the whole thing and see her words here. And I want just to say again that when she acknowledges in verse 20 about call me Mara, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, basically meaning call me bitter, not pleasant, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. She is not laying a charge against God. I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe it. It's just an acknowledgement of Judges 2.15. I'm not going to turn there again, but if you don't know what's there, because you haven't been in the past, make a note of Judges 2.15. This is Naomi acknowledging the reality of what Judges 2.15 said would happen and did happen. But some would think, well, the Lord's been very hard on her. She's been able to express this. She's a child of God. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Why would God be so hard? Whenever I hear language like that, when, when people say God is harsh, I, I, want, I want you to underline this. I want, I want you to get this because this is so often the case. People laying charges of injustice against God. Whether it's something they find in the Scripture. Oh, God was very sore in Abraham asking him to take Isaac up the mountain. Or, or God was very sore in the Canaanites when Israel came into the promised land. And God is very, he seems unjust. When you begin harboring thoughts like that, I want you to know the moment those thoughts come into your mind, it is evidence, it is fact, you have a view of God that is far too low. You're not viewing God properly at all. You're bringing him down and looking him on the level of humanity and saying, he seems unjust in this. Men and women, I want you to know there's only one thing any person deserves, and that is death. That's it. That is the only thing we deserve. We don't deserve anything else. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Ezekiel 18. You sin, you die. Thus, Every suspension of what you deserve is a mercy from God. If God calls for your death, if God calls for Abraham to take Isaac up the mountain and say, Abraham, kill Isaac, it's just because Isaac has committed sufficient sin and way more that would call out for his death anyway. And the same for the Canaanites. And the same for the suffering of Naomi. You can't lay injustice against God when he has preserved you to live longer than anyone deserves. Every breath that you take in is evidence of God's suspending from you what you deserve. And your view of God is far too low. Far too low. I don't want to hear that from any of you. I want you to know, whatever God brings upon you is good and far better than what you deserve, even the worst. It does my head in, you know, to hear Christians bring God down like this, to level injustice at Him, and to do it with the very breath that He has given. It shows the amazing long-suffering and patience of God, does it not? Naomi rebelled against God. She was a sinner. And she had no right to have anything suspended with regard to her own death. She should have went the way of Elimelech. And I'm saying this, and I'm saying it in a way that I acknowledge the same is true of myself, by the way. I'm not elevating myself and condemning Naomi as being something other than I am not. Every day I live, every breath God gives to me is a mercy. And so there's talk. Is this Naomi? It comes from this group asking this question among themselves, inferring this change within her or, or wondering, is this really her? And of course, they're not asking her, are they? They're asking it among themselves. And she comes and she hears of this question that is being arising from them and answers back. Of course, by their question, by this talk, is this Naomi? 
there is, there, there's, there's a lack of a welcome here, isn't there? They're not exactly running out to say it's good to see you. <laughs> or trying to figure out who she is. They're just talking among themselves. And maybe there's a bit, a bit of a, 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 a condemnation, a spirit of condemnation about it, perhaps. Oh, yes, 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 you left when the famine came. You ran off. You know, John Gill, he, he, he notes here that it may have been, or some of the, the Jewish writers on this passage note that uh, the reason for Elimelech and, and Naomi leaving wasn't just to avoid the famine, but that they were wealthy, highlighted perhaps by her language that went out full, that they were wealthy and they left Bethlehem not because they didn't have sufficient themselves and they were afraid of the famine, because they, but because they didn't want to give to the poor. And they didn't want to have to help those who were without. And so they left with all their substance and went away from the poor and went to Moab where they wouldn't have to deal with people who would come begging for grain. Now, I don't know if that's true. It's not evident from the passage. But perhaps that is the case. And maybe they're wondering, oh, you left us. You and Elimelech, so blessed materially. You had everything. And you went and you're gone, you left us in a time of need. And perhaps there was this kind of bitterness to order. And is it not just like the elder brother? Is it not like the elder brother? Luke 15. Never the prodigal's coming home. He's not interested at all, is he? He's not interested in engaging in the party. He's not interested at all in the whole praise of his return. In fact, he doesn't even call him my brother. He says, your son, when he's talking to his father. Your, your son. What way is that to talk? No love, no compassion, no concern at all. And the Lord had brought Naomi back. That's the thing. The Lord had brought her back. The Lord had brought her back and people are wondering, is this her? And God is, has been leading this woman and in spite of her afflictions, in spite of her burdens, God has brought her back. And you know, if, if you go through this chapter, it's very interesting to know a repeated verb. It's the word return. It can also be translated repent. But through this chapter, you'll find it on 12 occasions. In verse 6, 7, 8, 10, 15, 16, 22 is the word return. In verse 11 and 12, it is turn again. In verse 15, it's gone back. In verse 21, it has brought me. And in verse 22, it's in the perfect tense of being returned. As in, it's finally done. It's finally taken place. And the whole idea, especially uh, as, as we look at uh, verse 21 and what she says with regard to that, that the Lord hath brought me home again. We see God is in this. God is in this. God has brought her back. And that's good, you know. If you're sitting here saying, I don't want to come back. I'm afraid of what people might think if they knew I was away in the first place. And sometimes backsliders are afraid to come back because they're afraid of what people might say. What the talk would be in the church if they come back. Well, I tell you, you ignore the talk. I know this, God is bringing you back. And that's all that matters. The psalmist acknowledges in Psalm 119, 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. The affliction that she bore brought her back. The same Psalm, verse 71, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. To learn from God. And she had learned, she had learned. Well, what lessons she had learned and how hard they had been. But God afflicts his people sometimes to bring them back. The talk then of her return, then the testimony of her return. She goes on then as we move into verse 20 and 21, 21 really. But she says in verse 20, Call me not Naomi. Call me not Naomi. Here she refers to her original name. And again, she's like the prodigal, isn't she? For, I can't take time to turn to it. Time is rushing away as it is. But in Luke 15, you find that the prodigal said, in his mind, I will say, make me one of thy, of thy hired servants. I'm not going to go back with the, with the idea that I'm a son. I'm going back with the idea I'll be a servant. He changed his position himself in his mind. And Naomi does the same. She's saying, I am not what I once was. You knew me as Naomi, but that woman is no longer. I don't identify with that individual anymore. But I want to ask you, beloved, had anything really changed? With regard to her, her identity, had anything really changed? I say to you, no. 
Nothing had changed. Her circumstances had broken her. But the Lord had brought her back, and he brought her back because she was still pleasant in his eyes. That's the only reason he would ever bring her back. Still pleasant. Oh, she didn't deserve it. Oh, she didn't feel herself to be pleasant. But she was, you know. She was. And God brings her back. These verbs that we find through this chapter, 12 times in chapter 1, only 3 times in the rest of the book, showing the emphasis on this woman coming back. God brought her back. And in his mind, she's still Naomi. She is still pleasant. And I don't care how far you have been in the far country, child of God. You're still, you may say, I'm not worthy to be called a child of God. I say to you, you've been appointed to be a child of God. And that will never change. Never change. You're adopted into his family. You're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You're in Christ. And nothing will separate you as we ended last week's sermon with Romans 8. Nothing's going to change it. How often we fill our minds with, with, with lies. Lies that we get from our own hearts. Lies we listen to from the devil. Oh, I'm not worthy to serve the Lord. I, I'll, I'll maybe slowly make my way back. But I could never serve God again. I have met Christians who'd went well for God, went hard after God, did mighty things for God. Then they had a period in Moab. And you know when they get back, and God brings them back, they think they're brought back as a different person than what they were originally. Now they have the scars and marks of their sin upon them. That is true. But what they are in their identity in Jesus Christ hasn't changed. And they are just as forgiven when they come back as they were when they initially came to the cross. They're still Naomi. They're still the prodigal son, not servant. So wherever you are today, you are in Christ. Don't give up. But you are in Him. Be thankful. Be thankful. And make your way back, just like Naomi. Oh, don't talk to yourself the way she did. It exhibits a brokenness, and we'll learn something from that in a moment, but she says in verse 21, she talks about the Almighty. In fact, she repeats it. She uses it twice. She talks in verse 20 and 21, the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly, bitterly with me. And then at the end of verse 21, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. You know, as I read that, I thought, <clears throat> Naomi, that was your problem. That was your problem, perhaps. The reason you left Bethlehem in the first place is because you lost sight of the fact that God is almighty. So what if a famine comes? So what? Maybe they were worried about their sons. Maybe they weren't financially as well off as, as what I exhibited or expressed to you just a moment ago as some commentators think. Maybe they weren't. They had to go to Moab, they thought, to survive. But the one they served, they would only put themselves under him and seek first his kingdom. He is the almighty. And he is not affected by famine. And Elijah manifests this, doesn't he? Because when the famine comes, God sends the fowls of the air to provide. He didn't have to worry about the famine, did he? He just had to worry, worry about being right with God. And when you're in the midst of a famine, as, as may be the case even presently as the economy takes a turn down at the present time, what's your worry? Is your worry about what's going on now? Or is your heart resting in the fact that you serve under and for and are the child of the Almighty? And she can see it now. She can see it now. The Almighty hath afflicted me. The Almighty hath done this to me. If she could only have seen that the one she was leaving, the one she was departing from, the one she was turning her back upon was the Almighty, maybe she would never have left in the first place. The Almighty would have provided. And she says, afflicted me. That is, she, he has broken me. And she thought, saw this as a negative thing, you know. She saw it as a bad thing that she had been broken. And people see their experiences of life and they say it was a bad, it was a negative thing. But you know, the true child of God, the true child of God who begins to see things not as man sees, but as God has intended us to see, 
we begin to see this very thing. <laughs> this is a good thing for me. I need it to be broken. There is little serving God effectively if you are not first broken. I've said this before, and I said it again. The need to be broken is something we all must experience. Not every day, although there should be a brokenness over our sin. But I mean a, a cataclysmic breaking of the pride. Where no longer are you fighting against God. You've offered up everything to him. Like Mary. Mary, breaking the alabaster box. Not trying to just put a little hole in it or crack in it in some way she could just pour out some. No, breaking it and giving all. Or any of the other passages that te te teach us about brokenness. Chiefest of which te teaches us of Christ. Who reminds us every month when we take communion here in this house. He reminds us what? This is my body which was broken. For you. And why was it necessary to be broken? Why? Because through the breaking comes life. Through the breaking comes what God is able to do with us. If we're not broken, then we're too much like ourselves. We need to be broken. We need to be vessels that are broken and then refashioned by the potter's hand. We need that, beloved. And I don't want you to fear it. If God brings you through dark paths, if God brings you through a hard time, I want you to say, bless God. I'm not enjoying it, but he is breaking me. And in breaking me, he is making me more useful for him. He's making me more like Christ. Oh, we, we, we don't want that, do we? We don't want to be broken. We want... <laughs> We just want life to be as easy as we can make it. But the Lord believes in brokenness. And a wise person would even ask God to break them. And they sense their pride. She went out full, she says. Again, what did she mean by full? Certainly it meant she went out with her husband. And she went out with two boys. And maybe it also means she went out with financial wherewithal. And now she's coming back and she has no husband, no boys, and maybe very little money. In fact, we know that she had very little money because of the, the way they glean from the harvest later on in the book. So they have nothing. She's been broken. She went out full and came home empty. And that's what happens to everyone who neglects the Lord. If you're neglecting God, I want you to know this is what happens. There is no one, listen to me, there is no one who ever leaves the Lord and wanders away in rebellion and makes their way back full. No one. It doesn't happen. God doesn't bring a rebellious child back full. He brings them back empty. He brings them back with a thirst for himself, you see. Not full of the pleasure of life. Not full of all the enjoyment of your sin. Oh, I decided one day I'd just get myself back to church and start reading my Bible again. I had a great time, you know. But I thought, well, it's about time I got myself sorted out. That is never the way anyone comes back to the Lord. Never. And if someone ever comes back to the Lord like that, you can be sure God hasn't done anything in their hearts. They're coming back for some selfish reason and they're just not telling you the truth about it. When God brings back the rebellious, he brings them back empty. And that's a blessing. That's a blessing because it creates a thirst for himself, an emptiness that's longing and panging out for him. Only he can provide. And of course, we are meant to be full, you know. Not F-O-O-L, F-U-L-L. We're meant to be full. We are. And the scripture is very plain about us being a full people. Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost, Luke 4.1. Barnabas and Stephen were full of faith in the Holy Ghost, Acts 6.5 and 11.24. Darkness was full of good works and alms deeds, Acts 
If you're not full of those things, then you're lacking. You're meant to be full of them. And what about you without Christ? What are you full of? What are you full of? If you're here and you're not saved this morning, what are you full of? I can tell you what you're full of, depending on how you view Christ and what way you're living. You can make your boast of being full of skill, full of intellect, full of money. You can make your boast in those things, but I tell you what you're full of. If you're a religious hypocrite and you're here putting on a pretense and you're lying to everybody, you're sitting here acting like you're part of the body of Christ and saved, but you're not, I want to tell you what Scripture says you're full of because you're just like the scribes and Pharisees. Matthew 23, 25. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, Jesus says, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Verse 27 of the same chapter, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. And again, the next verse of the same chapter, Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Do you see, I don't need to be born again. I don't need to be saved. I, I have Jesus in a way that I understand him, but this repentance, this brokenness, this confession of sin, uh, preacher, come on now. I haven't really done anything that bad. I tell you, you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity, and you don't know your own, your own heart. You don't. But what if you're a rebellious heathen instead of a religious hypocrite? A rebellious heathen, you're like those mentioned in Romans 1, 29, filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. That's what you're full of. You see, Naomi is a believer who is neither full of the Spirit nor full of evil. God has broken her, emptied her, in order that she might be full again. A broken vessel, an empty vessel, and that's a mercy from God. Because you can be either one of two things when you go through this kind of experience that she went through. If you have your husband die, and if you have your children die, that can affect you in two ways. It's like Spurgeon said, the same sun that hardens the clay melts the wax. And that is so true. Because the afflictions of life do one of two things. They either harden you more against God, or in His mercy they melt you like wax, and they bring you broken back to Him. And for Naomi to come back is a mercy from God. She's melting under the heat of affliction and God has a purpose for her. But if she had stayed in Moab, there's no hope for her. God is so merciful to her. I'll be very quick, quick with the third thing, the timing of her return. Verse 22. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite as her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Incidental? No, not at all. Mentioning this for a reason. How long the journey had taken, we're not told. But we know they set off when they heard the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. But the arrival time is at this specific time, the beginning of barley harvest. Was it not just the beginning of harvest? No. Well, you see, in Israel they had multiple harvests. And the first to harvest was the barley harvest. Wheat would come later. And so at the barley harvest, it's coming in springtime. I suppose not far off from where we're approaching even at this time. And this was a time of joy for those in Israel. The main feast was at this time of year, the feast of the Passover. You should know that. Christ died at the time of Passover. Christ died at coming up to this time of the year. And so all this is going on at the time of their arrival. She is walking in at the beginning of barley harvest at the time when Passover is being observed and when the harvest is being gathered in and when the feast of first fruits is being offered, when they would bring a wave offering before the Lord. You see, at this first harvest, what they would do is they would bring uh, some sheaves of, the, of the, the barley and they would bring them to the priest and the priest would take those sheaves and wave them before the Lord. They had to be cut down and then waved before the Lord. And it happened, it happened on the eighth day. It happened on the day of beginnings. It happened on the resurrection day. It happened on the day that reminds us of life. 
You say, well, what are you going on about, preacher? Why is this significant? I'm telling you, they come back at the time, they came back at the time where all that was going on, everything that's being symbolized was reminding Israel of the death and resurrection of the Christ to come. That's what's going on. So how does she make her way back? She makes her way back. And God begins to feed her soul upon the very basic elements of the gospel. She comes and she's observing the message she needs to hear. Oh, every sinner needs to hear this message. Christ has died, yea, rather has risen again. And that's what she's saying. Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, I think it is. He's the first fruit. And all this is, 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 is being done. And, and when you read Leviticus 23, I think it's kind of verses 9, 10, 11, 12, in and around there, verse of, of Leviticus 23, it tells us about the wave offering. It tells us about waving these things before the Lord. And it gives us a little word. I'll, I'll just read it to you, actually. There's, there's an interesting little phrase there in what it says in Leviticus 23. I know my time is gone, but I want you to get this. When the priest takes this, verse 11, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, to be accepted for you. To be accepted for you. I have that underlined in my Bible. I don't know how long ago I underlined it, but you should underline it too. To be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And what's it telling us? It's telling us that that picture, that symbol of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was for what purpose? Of signifying the acceptance of the sinner before a holy God. A lamb had been slain. The blood had been shed. And even at that time, there was the killing of a lamb. It tells us that in the next verse. And he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering. All of that's going on as well. But, but there's not just the death of the lamb. There is the raising of the sheaf. There's the raising of the first fruits. There's the raising of Christ. And beloved, what is the purpose of Christ's resurrection? What does it signify to you? that Jesus rose from the dead, what does that tell you? The fact that Jesus rose from the dead tells you that he has brought everything about so that you're accepted in him before God. You're accepted. Accepted for you. It's all for you. It's raised up for you. Christ rose from the dead for you. This is the gospel. And this is the time when they make their way back. What a wonderful thing. What an appointment. What a blessing for Ruth when you think about it. Because whatever God had worked in her heart in Moab, as she makes her way to Bethlehem, she hadn't seen any of this. Oh, there was no observation of Passover. There was nothing of the priest doing all this down there in Moab. There was nothing to testify to her of all the symbolism that God had instituted to point to the resurrection of Christ, his death and resurrection. Nothing of that. And as the minute she walks in, she walks into Bethlehem and the Lord is telling her, look, Ruath, or look, Ruth, this is the basis upon which you're accepted. It is the death of Christ. It is the resurrection of Christ. You're accepted in the beloved. And that's the grounds upon which you come back to God, beloved. That is the grounds upon which you come back. Death and resurrection of Christ. Never get away from it. Never get away. So, how do I quickly tie this up? I need to skip over some things. You may be wandering in Moab. You, are, you may. And you're out there and you're trifling with sin. And you're listening to lies. And you're trying to perhaps play both cards at the minute. One foot in the world, one foot in the church. You're scared of what you would sacrifice if you had to give up your sin and your relationships. And you're scared of what it would mean if you gave your heart entirely to the Lord. That's such a sad place to be, you know. To stand there straddling, trying to live two lives, sitting on the fence, trying to be friends with these people. And friends... With these people, I'm forgetting what fellowship hath light with darkness. If there is light in your soul, if there is a longing and appreciation for Jesus Christ, if your inner being 
regardless of how broken you have become because of your rebellion, but you're longing for Christ and telling you, make a clean break. Make a clean break. Get off the fence. Get into Bethlehem. Feed where it is known as the house of bread. Look upon the sacrifices that are made by the perfect lamb laid down for you as your Passover. The lifting up of the Son of God, guaranteeing to your mind, giving you complete peace. The Father is pleased with his work. And I'm accepted in the beloved. Oh, may you get back. May God give you grace to do so today. Let's bow together in prayer.